Um, our next speaker is uh, Forrest Hoffman. Hi, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to your meeting. I'm not really a part of your community, but, uh, but I think James thought there might be some, some overlap in our interests. And having sat with you for the last couple of days, I definitely agree with that. Um, I'm more of an Earth system, uh, what, what we call ourselves Earth system modelers, which is actually probably less connected to Earth than you are, um, where uh, I actually work with uh, land surface models that are part of these global climate simulation models. Um, with many of the people that are up at the NCAR Mesa lab up here on the hill, um, so I've been working with these for a number of years, and uh, we're trying to do some interesting things with them in uh, Department of Energy funded research projects that I'll tell you a little bit about. Um, so let me go ahead and get started here. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the philosophy that, uh, that, that the Department of Energy has sort of picked up on, um, which was a topic of discussion on our first day, which was how to combine models and experiments together and how to do this, this model data integration. And uh, up at DOE, they sometimes call it by a, a moniker, MODEX, M-O-D-E-X. But uh, some of the people in that office actually hate that, that name, so I, I don't always use it. But if you hear it, that's, that's what it stands for. And it's, it's talking about a philosophy that's sort of represented by, by this circle. Which, is, uh, which doesn't really have a beginning or an end. It's sort of a vicious cycle. Um, but it's a way of uh, thinking about how we collect um, data in the field and how we integrate it into models and how it really there is a loop there, that there's feedback between um, the, the folks that collect the data and understand what's physically going on on the ground and the people that um, then do data synthesis and scaling and integration in order to provide information for model developers and allow that development to go on and uh, use modular design to make it very e easy to sort of uh, insert various kinds of modules and try out different formulations, model formulations, and that's sort of the stuff that, that, um, that this workshop is promoting using Python and, and other open source tools. And then the model simulations are conducted and uh, evaluated, analysis and benchmarking goes on, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and this helps us identify key knowledge gaps. And then we start the cycle again, where we identify based on those knowledge gaps what data we need, what kinds of measurements need to be made in order to improve our basic understanding. And if you really take the philosophy that the model itself is sort of an encoding of our scientific understanding, then you understand why you want to always sort of be improving that model and making it better and trying to understand exactly where it's not getting, getting the answer right. Um, so it really requires, you know, what I call a village um, to, to come together. And sort of in the middle and, and what sort of falls out of this are a lot of community data, community models and analysis capabilities. And within the DOE program, I have some of the acronyms for um, model codes and activities and systems and uh, and processes that have been set up that are sort of part of the a suite of community data and models and, and analysis capabilities that sort of feed uh, into various parts of this this modex wheel um, and then of course on the model development side we have in DOE a lot of advanced computational methods work that goes on on uh, really large high performance supercomputers um, like the Titan machine at Oak Ridge, which has 300,000 processor cores. Uh, and then there are data simulation and other kinds of capabilities that are used in various uh, parts of the, the process there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, process research and specifically about site characterization. How do we think about um, site characterization and dealing with all these environmental gradients when we want to go out and decide where to, to make measurements that will optimally tell us the most about 
um, the system and how best to improve a model of that system. And I'm going to talk about this next generation ecosystem experiments project for the Arctic. There are actually two NG projects now, one for the Arctic and one for the tropics that's just getting started. Um, NG Arctic is heading into a second phase after the first few years. Um, and what they're looking at really is, um, you know, because it's a DOE project, we're very interested in the partitioning of uh, emissions for uh, methane or CO2, and that has a lot to do with where the water is and how that landscape is changing. So we want to be able to simulate something that's a, a um, long time scale but small spatial scale process set of processes that really are not captured in these land surface models that we run over centennial kinds of, of time scales within a climate model. Um, so the idea here was to integrate, integrate across scales and that NG Arctic would perform process studies and observations that would be strongly linked to new model development. Uh, an application for improving the process representation within the models, but then being able to create a hierarchy of models that would then s allow us to scale up the knowledge that we gain at that fine spatial scale and be able to encode it or parameterize it, I heard that word last night a few times, uh, within this land surface uh, model that we want to be able to run really, really fast on high performance computers. Um, so this requires some methods for upscaling and downscaling and how do we take measurements at one scale and make them useful at another scale. Um, and there are a lot of constraints here in environments like the Arctic and the tropics where it's difficult or expensive or potentially dangerous to go make measurements. So we really need some systematic and objective way of representing the environmental variability that we know is out there uh, at the desired spatial scales. And so we, we need a method for um, providing some quantitative framework to, to help us make site selections and determine the representativeness of our measurements. Um, so we applied a, a multivariate spatial temporal clustering algorithm uh, at the landscape scale for about four square kilometer resolution across the state of Alaska to sort of demonstrate the utility of this uh, methodology for representativeness and scaling. And this is really an extension of the method that, uh, that I applied with uh, Bill Hargrove, a colleague of mine, to establish the NEON domains across the U.S. And, and with NEON, that's actually one thing that has not changed in that program, is where those domains live. Um, what we used here were 37 characteristics that were averaged for uh, the present and the future, two different decades, and we used a lot of model data here, as you'll see, and then a few observations that we assumed didn't change over time. But uh, in order to, to look at past the, pa the present and the potential future, we wanted to use uh, model data. So we used uh, monthly mean air temperature and uh, mean precipitation, and these are from downscaled GCM model results, climate model results, um, day of freeze and thaw, length of the growing season. And then uh, our colleagues at the University of Alaska that are part of this uh, NG Arctic project have a uh, a permafrost model that they've run underneath offline, uh, underneath these, these cli same climate characteristics. So that gives us information about maximum active layer thickness, uh, the warming effect or insulating effect of snow, uh, ground temperature information, et cetera, uh, and thermal offset. So that all comes from a model that was run with these same uh, climate forcings. And then we have a limnicity, which is sort of a pondiness of the area and elevation uh, data that went into this analysis. And the nice thing about this cluster analysis is that it, it does a very good job of partitioning up this 37-dimensional multivariance. Uh, so we can really capture the, the shifts in these gradients and uh, sort of understand at, at different resolutions or K values um, how those, those gradients play out across the landscape. And what you see on the left-hand side is a, a figure uh, if we ask the clustering algorithm for 10 different regions or 10 different ecoregions, we get a figure that looks like this. But we've run both the present and the future through the same algorithm, so we can also pull out what the future looks like. And what you see here is that the conditions presently on the Seward Peninsula will actually migrate to the north slope of Alaska in 100 years under this particular scenario because they're both colored the same way. We can, uh, we can turn up that knob, that K knob, and ask for a, a larger number of clusters, but we see basically the same result here, where now the Stewart Peninsula is broken into two basic ecoregions, 
uh, both of which then migrate to the North Slope of Alaska. So this is a warmer, wetter environment uh, from the, for the North Slope in 100 years than, uh, than it certainly is experiencing today. You can also see things like uh, the boreal forest, and, and these regions just sort of fall out on their own based, based on the, these, these driver data that go into the analysis, but it's completely replaced by something that looks entirely different in the future. We can keep going and ask for 50 or 100. Uh, another nice property of, uh, of this clustering algorithm is that we get out uh, centroids or mean values of those, those regions. Then we can search through um, the geographic space and find the cell that is most similar to that centroid. So th therefore, it best represents that whole combination of environmental characteristics that are contained within that region. And so we can identify these little, what I call blue balls here, that represent the, uh, the mean conditions of the, uh, the entire region. So those are the most representative locations for a region. So you could go in and uh, assuming that the mean conditions of that partitioned up multivariance are what you want, you can go and easily identify the best location uh, to, to optimally sample. Um, we can use this in a 37-dimensional phase space, data space, to do something else. Um, and here we can use the same Euclidean distance that the multivariate k-means clustering is using um, to sort of understand how representative any single point that we have already chosen is of this larger environment or larger domain. So in the, the subsequent maps, what you'll see is that the white areas are very well represented by a sampling location, and the dark areas or black areas are poorly represented by that location. Um, this, of course, assumes that, that uh, the surrogates, these climate variables that we've picked, maintain their predictive power and that there isn't significant biological adaptation. Um, but here we've picked Point Barrow, Barrow, Alaska, actually the Barrow Environmental Observatory where um, NG Arctic has started making measurements some years ago. And we can see that, that uh, Barrow, that location is very representative of the coastal north slope of Alaska. But as we go up this elevation gradient, that representativeness falls off. And after we surpass it, then, um, then Barrow does not do a very good job of representing areas in the southern part of the state. Um, we can also look at present and future representativeness. Uh, we can add another site in here, and now we've got much better coverage, much better representation of the, the full environmental space that's spanned across the state of Alaska by picking these two locations. And in fact, uh, for phase two of the project, um, NG Arctic is, is proposing to move much of their work down to, uh, down to the Seward Peninsula to look at watershed behavior there as a sort of space for time trade as a result of this analysis. Um, we can then look at, for instance, eight sites and see how our representativeness improves. Of course, these are very different than these very high elevation sites down here in the, si in the southern part of the state. So that so representing these areas does not uh, doesn't improve by picking those particular sites. Um, but for these eight sites, we can also come up with a dissimilarity table. I actually call these uh, Hojo charts, Howard Johnson charts, because when I was a kid, my dad would drive us around and we'd stop and we'd get lunch at the Howard Johnson's. And by the cash register, they had this little map. Uh, this little chart which showed you the distance from this Howard Johnson's to the next Howard Johnson, the next Howard Johnson, the next Howard Johnson. Of course, that was in geographic space, right? This is a phase space Howard Johnson's map or chart that tells us how far Barrow is from Council, right? How similar, actually dissimilar is it in this multi-dimensional phase space? And we can see that Barrow is most unlike Fairbanks. Well, that makes sense. They're also geographically far apart from each other. But we can see very small values, like Ivatook is very similar to Tulik Lake. They happen to be geographically close to each other, too, so that makes perfect sense. Um, but this is a really useful metric, which doesn't have any units because it's that simple Euclidean distance in that phase space. But it's a nice way of seeing how similar or different sites are from each other. And of course, now this will blow your mind. We, since we did it through time, we can fill out that full two-dimensional matrix where we've got space and time here, right? So we've got um, how similar is present-day Barrow to future Barrow, or how different is it? Um, we can see that, uh, um, for instance, um, present-day Barrow is more different from Council than it will be in the future. So that representativeness 
changes. So this gives us some quantitative way of understanding how similar or different locations are, um, which then helps us explain the representativeness of our measurements. So we had a little paper on this, um, which you can look up based on this algorithm, and we think it, it provides a nice systematic approach for picking sites, but also for helping us understand how representative measurements are so that we can upscale them and extrapolate from them based on other surrogates. And in fact, we're doing that now in, with, at, a, at a very fine scale within the Barrow Environmental Observatory by using Worldview 2 satellite data at a 2.3 meter resolution up here to, uh, to figure out what the plant distributions are within our sampling sites and be able to extrapolate individual plant measurements to the larger scale to feed our models. So we need to know in our model where those sites are located. And you can see actually this is within one of the sites. This little feature is a boardwalk that's built over there. So our plant measurements are not doing a very good job of representing the boardwalk. Whew, that's good. It's a very good sign. Um, and then, uh, well, let me go back. So these are actually projections of different, what we're calling plant functional types, like uh, forbs and evergreen shrubs that are made based on those, those sampling locations. We can also do this at a much larger scale. So we can pick sites like, for instance, in the, the CTFS forest geo network that's out there making uh, growth and litter measurements all over the world, and we can see that it, those sites are doing a very good job of representing forests planet-wide. And then these darker areas, which we've put hashes across, are non-forested areas, and they typically have poor coverage based on all of these sampling locations. But we can go in then and see what areas are poorly or well sampled by this constellation of measurement sites. And then we can look at, for instance, multiple networks like the Flux Network, Forest Geo, and Rain4, and, and we can pick any location on the Earth and see which of those networks it, it, um, best represents our sampling location. So these yellow areas are well represented by both FluxNet and Forest Geo. These sort of aquamarine ones are covered by Forest Geo and Rainfor, and then the individual colors sort of pop out. And the darker the color is, the, the less well represented it is. And this is sort of misleading because it suggests that we have good measurements out here in the tropics, but there's a lot going on down there. There's a great deal of biodiversity and very high productivity, so we need to layer on additional information in order to, to make this map even more useful. I'm going to move on and try to uh, quickly go through another part of this MODEX wheel, which is mo about model evaluation. How do we evaluate the performance of models? Um, and I've heard um, folks already mention benchmarking, and we've sort of adopted that term, and, um, and, and uh, really we're using it to mean a quantitative test of the model function or model fidelity that's achieved through comparisons with uh, uh, observational data and preferably that observational data has some uncertainty associated with it, but uh, as we all know, that's, that can be difficult to, to obtain. Um, acceptable performance on any given benchmark is necessary but not sufficient condition for a fully functioning model. We need lots and lots of ways of looking at these models and their model results to ensure that they're getting the right answer for the right reason. Um, we also um, are working on functional benchmarks, and these um, are, are tests of the model responses to forcings. So you know, we're interested in the performance of land surface models, but the forcing from the atmosphere model above or the, the, the forcing data from data sets may not be exactly right for a particular geographic region, but can we come up with relationships um, that should be expressed correctly? For instance, uh, productivity versus precipitation. Is there some relationship there and does it roll over? And in this case, we actually see from many observations um, that, that uh, as precip goes uh, above some threshold, NPP actually sort of rolls over, but in the models it keeps going up. So that identifies for us from a, a larger scale analysis uh, areas that we should be investigating in, in order to improve the model. Um, these, mo these benchmarks need to uh, draw on a broad set of observations um, at multiple scales, individual sites, and globally um, to really help us understand how these models are behaving. And there's a whole suite of reasons that I don't have to go through about why we need to scrutinize models in this way. Um, we need 
credibility with the public. We need to um, be able to, to also provide feedback to the measurements community to say, look, our models are very weak in this area. We need to go make particular measurements um, to identify and help us improve uh, those in the future. Um, and then accelerate uh, incorporation of those, those measurements in and even to provide us a quantitative skill score for uh, providing a lens through which we might look at model results or projections into the future. So there are a lot of these model intercomparison projects that go on with land surface models and various other models um, in earth system modeling. Um, and typically though, um, these groups are all sort of reinventing the wheel. They're going out and making these model simulations. They may or may not have the same sort of simulation protocol. And then they're doing custom analyses, which is great. But we think there's a need for something that we're calling ILAM, this International Land Model Benchmarking Approach or activity, um, which would standardize the way we evaluate models and incorporate uh, internationally community uh, accepted benchmarks for model data comparison. And uh, we had a meeting back in 2011 with a, a large group of people in Irvine, California uh, to sort of kick off this ILAM activity. Um, and the idea was to develop an internationally accepted set of benchmarks for model performance, um, advocate for open source software design, and strengthen linkage, the linkage between the experimental communities um, and monitoring remote sensing in the climate model communities. And our initial focus was to sit down and work on CMIT-5 model results as those were coming out. Um, and we think this provides a methodology for model data comparison and baseline standards uh, for performance. And that uh, a paper resulting from that workshop was published by Ichi Lo. That, uh, and the key figure is sort of identifying the model aspects to be evaluated, developing the benchmarks based on observations and experimental results, defining metrics for performance skills and evaluating them, um, going back and identifying whether it's model structure or parameters that need to be improved, and then feeding through this cycle. Um, we identified a whole bunch of benchmarks, areas where we thought the models should be judged on their performance. Um, and in some cases, uh, we have data sets supporting annual mean comparison, seasonal cycle, uh, interannual variability, or a longer term trend. And we weren't allowed to identify anything on the left hand side if we couldn't identify a data set on the right. So, um, and we all have to sit down and agree on what those data sets are and where they work well and where they're valid and how to use them. Um, for instance, we did something that we called CLAMP before. It was a carbon land model in our comparison. It was very easy because we were all in the same model, in the same land model. We were just trying out different biogeochemical uh, structures within that model. But for instance, we looked at leaf area index from satellite data. Well, satellites don't measure leaf area index. They look at radiance, right? Reflected radiance. So there's some algorithm, there's some model there. So these are really modeled observations and we need clever ways of using them. For instance, we gave more weight to a metric that was based on capturing the, the maximum, the peak leaf area index. So even if we think all of the LAI values are crap coming off the, the sensor or coming out of the data product, we at least uh, have more confidence that the highest crap number that's coming out is probably at the time when that leaf area index was the highest. And so th this is how you, you know, try to come up with clever ways to um, harvest information out of imperfect observations in order to give you metrics for measuring the performance of your models. And we also did uh, single site measurements from uh, flux tower sites across the U.S. and the globe. So there are comparisons here at multiple scales, um, some of which are not necessarily valid at a one um, degree grid cell that the model's putting out, but still it's interesting to compare and, and measure the performance and see how well we're doing if that's a, a large uh, predominant biome or plant functional type uh, where that tower is located. And these scores are always going to be C's and D's for a while as we try to improve our models and, and that's not a surprise. Um, We've more recently um, started a new project within the Department of Energy called the Biogeochemistry Climate Feedback Scientific Focus Area, and it's really um, 
it really sits in the middle between the Earth System Modeling Community and the Measurements and Experiments Community, and its goal is to develop these metrics and to work with the international community uh, to come up with standards for evaluating the performance of these models. So we were, we're working with model working groups, including the, the CESM folks at, at NCAR and uh, DOE's own ACME Earth, uh, Earth System Model Development Group. Um, to provide information to test beds, and we're developing an open source benchmarking package um, that we're calling ILAM that can be used um, by any of the modeling groups or by individual modelers, and they can run it on their desktop, and it uses these internationally accepted uh, benchmarks. Um, and we hope that people can run this, and, and when they go put out their paper, we'll have a standard profile, a standard suite of benchmarks, and they can identify what their score was on that standard suite of benchmarks and people will know what that means. Um, we're hoping that our project then um, suggests to the modeling community areas to improve the model and suggests to the measurements community what other kinds of measurements we need in order to, uh, to better judge the fidelity of the, the models coming out of there. We have an initial prototype of this tool already. We have a whole bunch of uh, sort of biogeochemical measurements, uh, hydrology, uh, uh, energy and radiation measurements. Um, that, that we're comparing with. Um, we have a graphics and scoring system and it's uh, free software that people can use already. Um, it's still under development, you can't see any of this, but I'm just going to tell you across the top are a whole suite of, of models that came out of CMIT-5, these Earth System models that are run for IPCC. And these green areas are a set of, uh, of metrics for um, biogeochemistry. These are the hydrology ones, these are the energy and radiation ones. Um, and uh, the values that you see in here are the score, the performance between zero and one for each one of the models based on uh, their performance on individual metrics within each of these classes. So it gets pretty detailed. I'm going to zoom in on the upper left hand corner and I'm going to show you uh, what um, just our comparison for gross primary production looks like down here. So we get another table that you can't really read, but we have the models then down the side here and the multi-model. So we come up with uh, the average model and see how the average model uh, performs in comparison to the benchmark. And in this case, this benchmark is from uh, the model tree ensemble of gross primary production, which again is a, is a modeled set of observations from flux towers. Um, we can look at the annual mean diagnostics for any of the models as compared with the observations. Um, we can drill down to individual sites or regions. This is within temperate North America, what the diagnostics look like. So we have a whole, whole suite of model performance here over the season averaged across this time period. And the observations are sort of buried down in here. Um, yeah, one minute, all right. Um, and then uh, we can compare an individual model like CESM against those observations and we see that we're peaking a little bit early. And most of those models were peaking a little bit early. Um, so more information about ILAM is available on its website. Um, the information about the, the current tool, which is written in NCL, NANCAR command language, is available on this website here. We're in the middle of developing a next generation version of this based on Python with all of these libraries. Um, we're going to do open development within a GitHub repository. It's already out there. This, the documentation is going into Sphinx. We're going to have a meeting later this winter. And then more information about our project and some of the science that we're doing to develop these new benchmarks and uh, measuring the performance of the models is there. And then I like to have a sort of a take home message. And that is to modelers to confront your models with data early and often, just like you do voting. Um, to make these tools and data free and uh, open to the, to the larger community, and to do experiments and analyses that sort of identify the weakness and help us suggest to the measurements community where they need and when to go make these measurements. And then the data gatherers should uh, make their data uh, available as quickly as possible so that we can use it to judge the performance of the models, um, to confront the environment with new sensors and drones and aerial and space-based instrumentation to answer questions about fundamental mechanisms, um, and then to conduct these measurements to improve the understanding of processes that will help us inform model development. And then we think our, that um, things like our model evaluation tools should be used by the integrated assessment community to provide a lens through which to look at projections of the future. And, uh, I always 
talk at these uh, workshops where people show folks out in the field measuring all kinds of things and wearing all kinds of respirators and, and cool equipment. So I thought I'd show you our pictures, which is a bunch of computer weenies sitting around pointing at screens and standing in front of supercomputers. That's what I have. Thank you. You talked a lot about the kind of connections between uh, data collection and models, which is kind of what this session is about. And, you know, for, especially for wider areas, um, you know, a lot of times there's uh, support from different community groups to collect information, data, citizen sciences. I was wondering if the uh, restrictions on citizens collecting information in open areas in Wyoming that are really restrictive and was making it illegal. Um, what kind of impact do you think that might have and if that's something that might trend? wider across the country. You mean legal restrictions on, I'm sorry. I didn't yeah, legal the restrictions. Answer. They've passed a statute that basically bans citizens from collecting data on open lands oh. in Wyoming. Oh, yeah, see, I don't know anything about those restrictions. I mean, I'm, a, I'm a, a strong advocate that all of this stuff should be open and that science is open. We even have a problem because I don't even use PowerPoint to do my presentations. <laughs> I use free and open tools. So I think it should all be open and uh, available to the public. And if citizens want to make their own observations, then that's fine. They don't you know, have to share them. But I think it should be free.